You might remember a video I did on a gear system called the Perpetual Wedge. It's a two gear system where you can get incredible gear reduction. If you print, say, a gear at 101 teeth, a gear at 100 teeth, you'll get a gear reduction of 100 to 1. It's amazing, actually. But of course, it does have its limitations, mostly in terms of adaptability. Equally, you might remember this. This is a cycloid drive where the cycloid disc doesn't have teeth. It's got these lobes. And as the lobes are rotated on a centric, they move around these pins, creating a gear ratio. Where the gear ratio is equal to the number of lobes. Now, it too has its problems. I mean, one thing is it's a devil to work out all of the mathematics for making those lobes, making it challenging to draw. So I thought, well, how about if we could combine the perpetual wedge with the cycloid drive in a way that would produce a gear system that was robust, easy, adaptable, big, and didn't take any complicated mathematics to do, that it could be really easy to do. So, of course, when we look at this, the first thing I thought is, well, how about we just make a gear? And I drew this. This, of course, will be on Thingiverse, and if anybody's interested, they can download the files and have a play with it. So drawing these two gears, I have covered before in video number 2364, called Fun With Gears, and video number 2352, Making Ring Gears. So basically, I just use those online gear designers to specify these piece of cake. This has 84 teeth and this has 80 teeth. And the reason for the teeth numbers is they fit inside each other really easily. But the teeth numbers are important because the gear ratio is this number of teeth, 80, divided by that number of teeth, 84 minus 80, so 4, so the gear ratio is 80 over 4, or it's a 20 to 1 gear. Now clearly, we can make this any size we want. And using that little formula, which is gear divided by ring minus gear, will give you the gear ratio you want. And of course, this rotates nicely inside there with a cyclic motion. So what we need is an eccentric. And the question about an eccentric is how far does it move? Well, you can measure it. Hold it at the centre position and measure that gap there. This one you'll find is five millimetres. And what that means is I have to create an eccentric with a throw of 2.5 millimetres because it'll go 2.5 one way, 2.5 the other. Overall, it'll move it five millimetres. And you do that by creating a circle, sticking a rod through it and moving that rod off centre by 2.5 millimetres and you'll get your eccentric. It couldn't be easier than that. So when we do that, we get our eccentric cam like that, we get our drive shaft, one goes in the other, and when I rotate it, of course, it will move this edge five millimetres from one side to another, and I put that in the centre of that centre gear. That then goes in the centre through there, line up the eccentric, and when we turn that, hey presto, our internal gear rotates around rather nicely. Now the size of the centre hole is actually just random, I thought 20 would be a good size. Clearly I could have made it bigger, Smaller would be a bit challenging, but just some size that that eccentric will fit into. Now we've sorted our input, what we need is our output, and that's the job of this plate. Now, on our input, we stole our idea, or have borrowed, if you like, that idea of these tiny tooth difference from the perpetual wedge. For the output, we're going to borrow that idea that comes from this drive, where we use a disc with pins, which is exactly what that is. So that goes over the central axle, and those pins locate in the circles there, so that when we turn that, this goes round, pushing those pins round in the same way that it did that. But instead of going round lobes and these projections, it's using gear teeth to do it. Now, of course, the big challenge here is, how do I know where to put those holes, and how do I know how big to make those pins? Well, stunningly enough, that's also pretty straightforward. 
Right, let's start with the gear that we pulled in from our gear drawing program. You'll notice that the teeth there look a little bit pointy. That's because I changed the pressure angle to 30 degrees. Normally it's 20, 25. I changed it to 30 because it makes it easier to rotate that big gear around the ring. And you'll notice there's a central that we're going to cut out, which is where the eccentric goes in the driver, and it's 20 by 20. That seems good to me. So I just copied it and moved it up here to give me a hole of 20 by 20. Just make sure that that's actually centered to the center here. So that centered there is that centered there. And then move it some distance away. Some distance away, whatever looks good to you, 20, because it seems reasonable. You don't need much more than that at this stage, to be honest. Then just highlight the two, copy them, rotate it by 60 degrees, and 60 degrees because, well, I want 60 uh, uh, six of these, so 60 degrees is more or less where I want it to be. Once you've rotated it at 60 degrees, all we have to do is repeat that five more times. And that's what we get. Now, if we highlight the whole lot and merge it by hitting the merge button, what we'll get is exactly the disk that we held up, and that's what you print off. But what, of course, we need to do now is change this, or use this as a guide to draw the actual pin disk. So let's shrink that down by five, and create another disk at 10 that will overlay that so that it comes some distance between the hole and the teeth. 120 seems like a nice size, so created a disc at 120 and now center it to the gear. Copy the gear, drag it and move the copy out of the way and change its size back to the original size, which in my case is 10 or if you like a centimeter. That's going to be the one that we print. This one we've got here is the one we're going to use as a guide. So what we do with that is ungroup it and hey presto, we'll get all those little holes back. Then we can delete the gear because we're just using it as a guide to place these holes. These holes, of course, are 20 by 20, which is too big for the pin. Now, if you remember, this will move five millimeters backwards and forwards. This is 20. The size of the pin is the size of the hole minus the distance it moves. So the pin size we want is going to be 15. So we create a cylinder at 15 and say 20 high. And I've made it 19 just so it sits a tiny bit above, below and doesn't scrape. Now if we hit that cylinder there, press down the shift, hit that one, and then center it to the hole that we were going to cut out, remove the hole by deleting it, that's going to be the position of the pin. And we repeat that all the way around. When we've done that, we can delete the center and replace it by something that the axle is going to go through, in this case 10.3, and that will be the main axle that goes through. Highlight the whole lot, group it, and hey presto, we have our drive plate with the pins in the right place. Now we can shove it in place. There's a clip that actually fits in there. So we pop the clip in, and then there's a handle that goes on the other side. And hey presto, we've created our Frankenstein drive that has a 1 in 20. Let's have a look at it. Right, I've put a dot at the top there, which is a direction the handle is facing. If I turn that handle one full turn, then you'll see that dot has moved about 1 20th of a rotation. So that is a 20 to 1 gearbox. So, if you remember those two simple rules, the gear ratio is the difference in teeth number, and the diameter of those pins is the diameter of the hole less the throw. You can make this in pretty much any size you want. Now, this is obviously demonstration, so you may think, well, there's a lot of friction. Actually, that's rolling friction in there, but you could just replace those with bearings, if you liked. So if I made this hole say, uh, well, I've got skate bearings, so they're 22, so I'm in 27. Instead of having a pin size of 15, it was eight. Then I could pop bearings on there, just normal skater bearings, and they'd do the same job. So we could put bearings in here. It might be fun because I used just a normal spur gear to try herringbone gears with this to see what would happen if you replace the spur gear with the herringbone gear. That would probably be quite cool. Obviously, this is the output. So we can either take an output axle up here, or we could put gear teeth around here to make that an output gear, whatever we wanted, really. And that is the input. So again, that's where your motor or whatever it is, is going to attach. So 
very easy to draw, quite robust, incredible gear ratios you could get out of it. I don't know what more you would want from a set of gears with a high reduction ratio. So for me, perhaps the most perfect gear ever, even though it is a bit of a Frankenstein between the perpetual wedge and the cycloid drive. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching and please do remember to like and subscribe.